1967 marks the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the United States Air Force as a separate military service. And it also marks the 60th year of the use of military aviation as a part of our nation's defense structure. Officially, our military aviation began in August 1907 when Captain Charles Chandler was named officer in charge of the United States Army's Aeronautical Division. His staff, two enlisted men. The mission, study the flying machine and the possibility of adapting it to military purposes. The Wright brothers had made their first flight in 1903 and then had gone to Europe to find a market for their flying machine. Flown for our government in 1909, their improved plane becomes our first military aircraft. She made about 42 miles an hour. Glenn Curtis, another aviation pioneer, also built some of our first military aircraft. But our air power growth was slow. After four years, only 41 pilots had earned these gold wings. Nineteen seventeen. We have fifty-five planes, none suited for combat, so our pilots are sent to Europe and join British, French, and Italian squadrons to train and fight in World War I. In the States, the battle of manufacture is on. Six hundred million dollars to build four thousand five hundred aircraft. September 18, 1918 the greatest air battle of the war. 1,500 Allied aircraft, nearly half piloted by Americans. Two months later, the enemy capitulates. As we moved toward the 20s, the plane became a toy. Our war-trained pilots turned to barnstorming. Gypsy flyers earning their way with any spectacular stunt. But there were other daredevils with a more serious purpose, flying safety. Parachutes were not generally accepted. To prove they worked, many of the test jumps were made by the inventors themselves. The first cross-country flight as a military T-2 that left New York with over 700 gallons of fuel lands at San Diego. In the same era, the first airmail service, inaugurated by President Wilson and carried by military air between Washington and New York. Practice draping missions against troops with anti-aircraft weapons becomes part of our military aviation training program as we refine the techniques of close air support for ground forces. Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, on the right, insisted that planes could sink ships. Our military leaders of the day watched as he proved his point in a series of tests. The climax is the destruction of a captured German battleship, a vessel considered unsinkable. In 1923, the Barling, 32,000 pounds, moving along at 61 miles an hour. It didn't make the inventory, but it was a valuable test vehicle for our aeronautical engineers. Aerial refueling is developed, and the famous question mark remains aloft for nearly a week. In 1930, we conduct our first polar maneuver. Planes had now flown the ocean, so there was the possibility an enemy could invade our nation over the Arctic, and we were determined to be prepared. Bundles of food dropped to snowbound Navajo tribes in Arizona in 1932 in one of the first uses of military air for mercy flights. The P-26, our first metal-covered fighter in production, joined the Air Force in the early 30s. Looking like a praying mantis, 
the B-9, our first all-metal monoplane bomber. Next, the B-10. It could fly in excess of 200 miles an hour, had retractable landing gear, and was considered the fastest and heaviest bomber in the world. The B-17 makes its first flight in 1935. It was destined to become the flying fortress of World War II. September 1st, 1939. The war begins when Hitler directs the Nazi army and Luftwaffe to attack Poland. Next, the invasion of Holland and Belgium as the powerful Nazi air arm and panzers move toward Paris. June 22nd, 1940, France surrenders. Now, only Great Britain's Royal Air Force remained for the Luftwaffe to conquer, and the Nazis' air battle for Britain began. On the other side of the world, the rising sun brings dawn and death. It's Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. But 14 of our aircraft managed to get airborne and destroy 10 attacking Japanese. Four months later, B-25s are launched from the carrier Hornet. They're Jimmy Doolittle's Raider, bringing the first impact of the war to the Japanese. B-17s lift off from Midway in June 1942 to join our Navy's carrier-based aircraft in meeting a Japanese task force for a battle that is to mark a turning point in the war in the Pacific. The mission of the Japanese planes was to rake Midway's gun emplacements and bomb the way for an invasion. But when our planes hammered back, the issue was decided. During the three-day battle, Japan lost four carriers, two heavy cruisers, three destroyers, 275 aircraft, and 4,800 men. The Japanese offensive in the mid-Pacific was broken. In the Far East, another battle, the War of Logistics. Military air flies the hump from India to our fighting forces in China. Ships loaded with cargo were waiting. Before the war's end, we carry more than one million tons of supplies over the hump. Nazi subs. In the first half of 42, they sank 506 Allied ships. B-24s were one of the weapons used to meet this menace. Equipped with radar, they patrol the sea lanes on seek and destroy missions. And by October of 42, the killer sub is virtually eliminated from our home waters. In Europe, the Air Force has orders to fly through Hitler's back door and destroy his major oil industry, the refining plants at Ploesti, Romania. B-38 Lightning bore in. B-24s have their say. And the enemy answers, jamming up thousands of rounds of flak. When the argument was over, our military air was victorious. We destroyed nearly 90% of the Romanian oil that was feeding the swastika war machine. D-Day. The invasion of Hitler's Europe is mounted. Leading the attack, air power plays a major role. Interdiction and airlift of troops. <laughs> Allied
Allied surface forces hit the beaches of Normandy. As ground troops fought for a foothold, our bombers cut enemy lines of communication and supply. Long before the invasion, our air forces had virtually swept the airfields and the skies of Europe of enemy aircraft. General Eisenhower was able to assure the invasion force that on D-Day, if you see any planes, don't worry, they'll be ours. Nazis felt the strike of our air power in Europe, so the Japanese felt the strike, day and night, of our new strategic bombers, the B-29. Tokyo burns. Surrender comes in September 1945. 1947. Congress makes of our air power a separate and distinct military department, the United States Air Force. Its first secretary, Stuart Symington. Its first chief of staff, General Carl Spotts. For the new Air Force, the strategic bomber is the B-36, the longest range bomber of its time. For the tactical and air defense functions, the F-80 and F-86, the first jets, are being developed. And already, our first experimental rocket plane is flying. Nineteen forty-eight, the Berlin blockade. Nothing can move in and out of West Berlin. Over two million West Berliners now face starvation, unless they can be fed by airlift. For 15 months, 24 hours a day, with cargo planes finally landing every three minutes, the people of Western Berlin are sustained entirely by this humanitarian airlift directed by the United States Air Force. Korea, 1950. Communist North Korea attacks the Republic of South Korea. The communist attack is powerful. The defeat of South Korea seems assured, except that the United States is committed to aid in their defense. Air power is our only weapon ready to immediately stem the flow of enemy troops. And we stage aircraft of our Far Eastern Air Forces. The 24th Division is flown in to be supported by forces from 15 member countries of the United Nations. Air hits hard as our ground forces dig in. The North Korean Army is stopped. Now, the long, hard job of driving it back begins. Interdiction, with air power destroying today equipment and supplies the Communists intend to use tomorrow. September 15, 1950, American forces land at Incheon, flanking the communists on the west. The communists are forced back toward the Yalu River, and our air power makes a massive combat airdrop behind enemy lines. Nearly 4,000 troops and their supplies. Then, the big stuff, jeeps, ammo, and trucks. In the air battles, our fighters maintain a 10 to 1 victory over the enemy MiGs.
fighting end in 1953. 1954. The Air Force Academy is established by Congress to provide a new generation of officers for the new Air Force. Officers trained in aeronautical sciences and the specialized use of air power. Now we are truly a new Air Force. We build the B-47 Stratojet and our series of Century Fighters, the F-100, F-101 Voodoo, the F-102, the 104 Starfighter, the F-105 Thunder Chief, the F-106 Delta Dart, F-4 Phantom II, and for transports, the still reliable C-47, C-54 Skymaster, C-119 Flying Boxcar, C-123 Provider, C-130 Hercules, the 135 Transport and Stratotanker, C-141 Starlifter, our deterrent bombers, the B-52 and the B-58 Hustler. We had Texas Towers to warn of an enemy air attack. Today, the dew line is one of our radar air defenses and BMUs can detect enemy missiles. As we develop our missile force, the Thor, our first intermediate range missile, The famous Atlas, our first ICBM. In the beginning, it had problems, just as our early aircraft had theirs. But our aerospace technicians found the answers. And Atlas becomes a reliable weapon and a booster for a vehicle that takes our first close-up pictures of the moon. Air Force Titan II, the booster for all NASA Gemini flights. June 3, 1965, Titan II sends Air Force Major White for his famous walk in space. In the same month, the free world's most powerful booster, the Titan 3C, is successfully tested. During these same years, the Air Force brings a new generation of missiles into the inventory, the Solid Fuel Minuteman. Today, this retaliatory force can be launched in salvos from underground sites in a matter of minutes. Experimental vehicles. The X-15, a manned rocket ship, and for vertical takeoff and landing, the Tri-Service XC-142. The supersonic XB-70. The F-111 with variable sweep wing. The YF-12A Experimental Interceptor. For strategic reconnaissance, the SR-71. The Air Force C-5A to be our largest transport aircraft carrying a quarter of a million pound payload. HH-3Es, modified for mid-air refueling, become the first choppers to cross the Atlantic non-stop. A new rescue technique ground-to-air recovery by an HC-130. Vietnam. American air power gives unparalleled support to Allied ground forces.
it takes air power to move ground troops into battle. To supply them with ammunition, food, and equipment. To find the enemy where he hides. And to mark his position for our fighters. It takes air power to find and engage the enemy beyond the range of ground penetration. It takes air power to supply remote and surrounded outposts. It takes air power to fight the enemy on his distant and secret trails. to destroy his far-flung supply lines. And it takes air power to guard friendly hamlets day and night. And to hit the enemy, north and south. Even our strategic bombers, the B-52s, play a tactical role in Southeast Asia to convince the enemy that he cannot hide that he cannot hold the initiative, and that he cannot hope to win. And it takes air power to save our airmen down in the water, trapped in the jungles, mountains, and marshes. And it takes air power to evacuate our sick and wounded to the United States in only 25 hours. Behind our air power, there are people. Airmen who will risk their lives to save others as quickly as they risk themselves in the fight for freedom. Fly Belgian troops to the troubled Congo. Evacuate Belgian refugees. Airdrop wheat for the starving. Rescue the people of Thailand. Give medical aid for the diseased and the injured. Have love for the young. This then is 60 years of military aviation. 60 years that have opened one of the greatest career fields in the world to the young people of our country. It is a 60-year history of flight and bold men. Tomorrow, there will be more pioneers. Men of our Air Force who are not afraid to make decisions. Airmen who think beyond today. Men of the aerospace age who are willing to try what has never been tried before.